G'day listeners and welcome back to another episode of the Keeper League podcast. We're the AFL fantasy podcast that doesn't talk about the superstars. We only talk about the lesser knowns and the players that are going to bring value to your draft and Keeper League teams. Uh, On today's episode, I am joined by the godfather of AFL fantasy, uh, Don Warnione, you might want to call him, but uh, Adam Warney Child, welcome to the podcast, mate. Oh, F, I don't know about all of that, but yes, it's a pleasure to be here. Great to be chatting with you. And I'm li- after listening to Kay's talk about Collingwood, I've, I've got some uh, big shoes to fill because uh, he's, the, he's the Bombers man. And to choose me over him, that's probably going to be a controversial decision. Well, I think Kays was uh, sick, and about, sick of talking about the Don, so he just wanted to talk about something different. And uh, yeah, plan to have you on for this one for, for a while now. So good to finally uh, put it into action and get you on to talk about your Dons. So um. Yeah, talk, let's talk about the Dons in general to start off with. Describe their year last year for us, Warney, in your words. Uh, very disappointing, very disappointing, full stop, I think. Um, a year, well, every season you always hold some hope, and if you've made the finals, especially uh, the Bombers playing a final down here in Launceston as well, which is a, a bit of a step in the right direction. I thought we were going to reset that bloody Twitter account of um, <laughs> days since Essendon won a final, got all up and about, and then obviously that didn't happen. But, yeah, to finish... Uh, where was it? Fourth last in the end. It's, yeah, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't a pretty season. And then just all the off-field stuff as well was pretty ugly. So fingers crossed now with uh, we've got Brad Scott, the, the better Scott. Um, that'll, be, that'll be a good thing for the Bombers. And, well, fingers crossed um, it's better for the club in general, but also maybe for our fantasy scoring as well. Well, let's unpack that. So what have you heard as a supporter as to how you're going to play this season. Typically when seasons have, uh, sorry, clubs have a season like Bombers did last year and a new coach comes in, you look at someone like Collingwood, um, the emphasis, and like Gold Coast, like once upon a time as well, the emphasis seems to be on defence for, for a bit of time to kind of stop the bleeding, stop the scoring and then work in other things. Could you see something like that happening at the Dons or do you think there is going to be some positive shifts for fantasy? Yeah, I think defence is probably where the Bombers can actually make a difference as well. They've got some pretty good cattle there for that, and I think we've seen that over the years as well. However, I don't know. It's just that the thing at the moment, though, is speed, 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 and I'm not sure what Brad Scott's going to have as, like what his philosophy is really going to be with that, because um, I guess he... He's been out of footy, but he's been, you know, the the head of AFL development or whatever his job was there. And so he was probably seeing everything from a lot of clubs. So that was probably one of those glass half full moments about getting Brad Scott there is that he's been across all the clubs. So in that role. So that was one of the things. But yeah, I think defence is probably where they can be. And you can see that they've got that experience there. Like we'll um, probably mention some of those guys as we're looking forward with that. But um, like even that, that's what a number one pick, his role is going to be in Andy McGrath like I think that that's going to be something they've got back there also Heppel in the last couple of seasons he's moved back to defence and and we might see that experience do that which could then potentially be a good thing for fantasy in the sense of does the game slow down a little bit for that yeah, well, thankfully, those two players are 2G4P, so we might not unpack them too much. <laughs> but uh, no, it's good to mention those ones as well because, um, yeah, they are definitely going to offer some value. But uh, speaking of value, we'll talk about some undervalued players to start off with. Uh, this uh, season, I know you've been listening, Warney, but for anyone who hasn't been listening, um, I've separated players into uh, undervalued breakout contenders or stash options. So, yeah, basically with our breakouts, we're talking players that have the potential to go bigger than they produced last year or are undervalued um, for certain reasons such as injuries or form and things like that. So the first player I want to talk about is Jordan Ridley. So he's undervalued because we know what he can produce. We saw him a couple of years ago. He was a really solid 80 average defender. Um, I guess the the issue with him, there's a very crowded back line now at Essendon. Um, his role kind of switched up a bit. He had a nice cushy kick in role. was a bit loose. We've seen the emergence of Redmond um, come in and it feels like they've kind of swapped roles with McGrath was in and out of defense last year but settled there in the end looks like he'll settle there this year what do you see Jordan Ridley producing this year yeah I guess that's the thing we're all very excited about him you know this time last year and thinking that he's going to take that game to the next level because of what we saw and I think sometimes and this is something of my philosophy too is that the corona ball year we nearly need to um, erase that from our memories yeah. a little bit there with what that was and and Potentially Ridley's one of those guys there. Is he just going to be an 80 guy for the uh, rest of his career, which is still obviously a very fieldable player in all your forms of fantasy. But I think, um, yeah, I think 
the upside is potentially there. However, it's just so many questions and the Brad Scott question's one of those, but Mason Redmond really did come on and some of those games that he had, and he had some of those beast scores in that back half of the season there too, I think. Well, actually, he had round 10 was a 133, round 14, 125, round 18, 143, and 139 in round 20. So he just those massive ones with the marks, which is... And that's going to be, obviously, for any defender, where they're going to be able to rack those up a little bit too. And so the, we also think about those kick-ins too. So um, they sort of shared those a fair bit, really, um, yeah. between sort of Redmond, Ridley and Hind as well um, was in the mix with those a fair bit of the way. And then if we do have a Heppel and a McGrath back there as well, the guys that could potentially be taking those as well. So there's no sort of stranglehold on on who is taking those kick-ins from here on. So it's it's a really – I'd like to say it's a risky play, whatever we do with him, um, but there is upside and we could see um, what Ridley is all about because he's super young and I think depends – we need to really see what Brad Scott wants to do there, but it could be one of those things week in, week out. It could be really different between a Ridley and a Redmond. So you see, let's just um, let's just kind of make a call here. So average of seventy five point five last year. Do you see it getting to the back to that eighty mark, or do you reckon he struggles? Yeah, I think I think he can, and that or that can come from a couple of kick-ins as well. We sort of think about that. You can break those stats down a little bit, and a couple of kick-ins, a couple of those extra marks back there. But it, I think it could be one of those sort of sporadic scoring roles as well, and we might see that because even talking up Redmond with some of those big scores there, he still had some stinkers in that as well. Like there were a couple of 40s and 50s there for him. And whereas, you know, you're looking at your Ridley, you're seeing maybe not the lows that we saw from um, Redmond with that, but, um, yeah, you'd want those, those bigger scores coming from him like we did see those couple of seasons ago. Well, we'll move on to the next one. So Nick Hind, you did mention him briefly before. He's kind of similar to above, but basically I want to know, was his 21, 2021 season flash in the pan or, you know, can he get back to that kind of rebounding halfback role that sees him nets a lot of possessions? What do you think? <laughs> when I was thinking about this was pretty much what happened, like the Bombers players in their first year at the club, yeah. um, and it took me back to my mate Devin Smith, like what he <laughs> did in that first season he had in the red and black where he, well, obviously was dominating our 108 average, I think it was, yep. um, just going in there for that and then fell off a cliff after that too. And so uh, is that what it's about? Is that what happens when you go to the Bombers? You get a little bit of a, a little bit of juice in the system. Maybe that's not the right term to use for the Bombers, <laughs> but it gets you up and about for it. But um, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's a complete flash in the pan because of the way he plays. Like, um, But again, a bit of role, like is it that sort of moving up on the wing? If the speed is the thing, he's the yeah. man that's going to be used for that. And and that's where we need to look a little bit into the, the Bombers game plan as such to make sure we're understanding what um, what is happening there. So if, if they are running and gunning it, he's going to have the ball in his hands a little bit off that halfback, you'd think. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, like I said, I, I just get the kind of feeling that he is a bit of a quality of a quantity type though at times, or he's the guy that you will break your line, but not the one that you go to for, you know, bulk possessions and things like that, that may hinder you for fantasy. But yeah, again, we've seen it in the past, so he could be one that actually could, you know, reproduce what he had in the past. It's an interesting role too, I think, like some of that in, in thinking about, you know, your Sards, um, those types of players, even like think about Connor McKenna being back there at the Bombers. That's sort of what they were in the side for. And yeah, you're not always, it's hard to bank, I guess. That's the yeah. that's probably the key thing. It, you are going to see those up and down scoring. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, we'll move on to the next one. Um, Cole Langford is the next player I want to talk about. So with Langford, he's got forward status this year, so he's had that in the past. He has also in the past averaged 80-plus, so he's done that twice in two seasons. Um, do you think he is more of a forward type these days, or do you think he can push back up to that wing and score an 80-plus for us, listed as a forward? What's your thoughts? Yeah, the, the forward status is obviously very handy to be thinking about. I think he's one of those guys that in single season drafts too, you feel like he's a guy that you pick up, at, well, I do probably as a bomber supporter, you pick up off the waiver each year and and then you just let down or yeah. he just does what he does kind of thing and yeah. you go, yeah, I picked him at one week because he did that. The thing I really think about him is just those young guys coming through as well and in the sense of, you know, like a Nick Cox is a good example there about someone that is that unicorn as gets as that gets thrown around that he's probably someone that, that will play on the wing a little bit more like he did in that debut season yep. there. Um, but 
Langford's probably a little bit of a Mr. Fix it as well. So he, he might, he's got those, he's got a bag of tricks, which can include that forward time as well. So that's something that I think is, is the hard thing. Obviously he can average 80 because he's done it a couple of times. So yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is, the Bombers are really tricky and it's like any club that's got a new coach, you've just got to, you need to see a little bit first, but that's what this game is in the preseason for us as fantasy coaches, try to predict that. And it's, it's a tricky thing to predict. Yeah, on the keeper league side of things, though, like there is potential and scope for him to actually keep forward status going forward. And if he does, like he averaged sixty five last season, he and that was you know pretty injury prone and things like that. Missed a lot of footy. Think only played nine games. He could potentially just average seventy to seventy five in that range, and that's super handy for a forward given the scarcity. I think in in drafts and keeper leagues in particular. So he's not the worst option. I don't think he's probably not the prettiest name he once was, but one of those guys that a lot of people probably aren't looking at too closely anymore and but could you could pick him up and he'll provide you some value there do you think that's fair yeah i think so and uh, i feel like he's a best 22 player that's the yeah. that's the thing and that's at that Half range for those forwards is that that's what you want yeah 100 percent agree like yeah the i think the- last year's average Last year's average, too, he has a one in that. So it's a very yeah, true. untrue um, representation of his yeah. year sort of thing. Like he had a couple of tons in that and a 90 as well, so out of the nine games. So, yeah, there was enough there to go 65 is not where we're at and that 75 is not really out of the question of what he did last year. Yeah, and as I said, as a forward, you take that every day of the week and has the potential to keep forward status going forward as well. So that's causing a lot of chaos in teams with the position changes as well. So just another thing to factor in. Um, We'll move on to some breakout contenders now. So I've been waiting for this guy to break out for years, but Jai Caldwell. So his first season at the Bombers was injury affected. He averaged 73 last season, but he just seems to, last season he seemed to get thrown into a variety of roles. Settled as a bit of a tagger in the end. Do you see that as his role? And what can he average if that is his role? I think a lot of guys, um, they have to play a role like that for some time and whatever some time means for him. Is it this year as well? Does it move forward even further than that? But, um, yeah, it's a really tricky one because he was obviously um, – looking at centre bounces and that sort of stuff throughout the season. We thought that was going to be a big part of him, but he was more forward than midfield, but he obviously held the uh, – it was mid only. So that's the that's thing that told us that he – that's what he was playing. So, um, yeah, I think he can be thrown around into different roles and he's not going to be the ball winner. I think that's at the that's the key from what I've seen so far is that I don't think he's going to be the ball winner we thought he may have been. Um, but, again, he's super young. Like, he's um, got plenty of time to grow into that. And um, I guess the tricky thing is you've got another guy like a Zach Merritt in the side next to him that's probably going to get a fair few more touches than him um, regardless of what's going on in those pins hitting midfielders too I think that's the that's the other side of it and and do we see some of the guys go ahead of him as well like is he you know like a, the way Dylan Shield finished the year last year is that something that we might see go into this season we've already had all the the hype about him in some of the preseason photos and yeah. his role so he probably sits ahead there so you've got your yeah your merit as I mentioned but then also Darcy Parrish I shouldn't yeah, exactly. forget about him because yeah, yeah. he's a midfielder now too so yeah. he's sort of definitely behind the pecking order of the the merit and the and the parish and then Shiel, that's his main trick. So he's, he can't do a lot more than that. So he's sort of behind that crew, let alone what they might do, blooding some of these kids through there too. Yeah, that 100% matches my thoughts as well. Like, And you kind of mentioned it um, in passing, but like you, that midfield role is pretty deep. Like for how much he struggled last year, it's a deep midfield, really. It's kind of like your defence. And the, the opportunity to score is there. And I think that's the way he breaks into that midfield group is to play that um, tagging role. So Caldwell... Like, I love him. <laughs> like, I want him to break out desperately. I just, I'm not 100% sure we see it this season. But there's definitely scope. Like, he's still young. You'll see some of your, your I guess, merit probably move out a bit. She'll get on a bit in age, all that sort of stuff. Like, he might overtake some of those guys naturally over the next two or three years. So, he's not one to write off. He might be one we'll throw in the stash category later on. But, um, yeah. Yeah, tackles, tackles is a thing that can keep him up there with some numbers as well. Yeah, like, true. almost a quarter of his points last year came from tackles. So, that's a positive sign if he can maintain that and then get a little bit more of extra the touches as he, as he matures. Yeah, hopefully that's the case. Um, we'll move on to Archie Perkins next. So what do you reckon, Warnie? Can 2023 be this guy's year? What do you think? 
I hope so because I'm a massive Archie Perkins fan and I think the breakout will happen at some point. That's that's the thing. I think we looked at those junior numbers and liked them and, and he's got a bit of swag. I think we remember yeah. that from draft night and all that sort of stuff. But, um, but again, talking about that deep midfield, However, he's someone they will want to get in there. I think that's a that's a thing. But he's probably got the forward tricks that help him Correct. as well. And yeah. I think that's the other the other issue that it could be a little bit of a slow burn to get there um, all the way through. So that uh, keeper league, he's probably going to keep that forward status. So that's always going to sit there in our heads to be thinking about we can keep him for a while and and whether that keeps him as a little bit of. Um, lets him stay in our side for a little bit longer or he becomes that trade bait as well to be having as part of your side um, because that's something that we'll we'll see. Like centre bounces did increase as the season went on there. Yeah. So I think, yeah, again, I, I hate going back to this and it's a bit of a cop-out, but the new club and the new process, what is that going to look like? A new, sorry, coach and the new process, what's that going to look like for him? Yeah, uh, my gut feel is he does kind of maintain that midfield forward role, mainly forward really. But in, in positive science, he did boost his um, CBA numbers, as you mentioned, up to 70% in some games. So he was getting a fair run. Um, in, I think in one game he got that high. So yeah, there, there is positive signs there. I think, like you said as well, he's got the tricks up forward. But he's one of those players you just look at and you go, this guy's going to be a gun one day. Like he's just got that movement about him, the way he kind of goes about things, that bit of swag that you said as well. He does look like he's going to be a gun one day, just that old gut feel kicking in. So he's one I really like for the future. And again, might not be the breakout this year, but as a forward, like to be honest, if you can get a 75 out of a forward, a young forward this year, that's a breakout in my eyes because it's going to be pretty hard to find him, I think. Yeah, definitely. And I think with that too, at least we can hang on the hope that he will be a forward for a little bit longer. I think that's the other key. Absolutely. All right, we'll talk about some stash options next. So these are the guys that might not uh, break out this year, but ones you want to look at two, three years down the track. So the first one I want to talk about is Massimo D'Ambrosio. He was the uh, mid-season pickup for Essendon last year. He looked awesome when he was down in defence last year. I think this second game, I think he showed the goods, but ended up forward by the end of the end. That kind of ties into that stack defence that we talked about. Um, yeah, might take a couple of years, but what's your thoughts on Massimo? Yeah, it could be a long burn, a very long, slow burn for us. So um, I guess, that, yeah, and it's all going to come down to your league settings to see how long you could you could go with that. So uh, for me, I, I'd like to be a believer, but it might be that he sits on that outer and, and the development might be a bit of time. Like he did look good and that was massive credit to him getting a game so early as well after the mid-season draft. I think that's something that um, if you're seeing a club have a bit of a crack there and they, and they gave him a, a little bit of a run at it too. So he played seven games, sort of played those last couple of the season as well. They were there. There was just sort of the one score in there that was, you know, a nice score. He had a, a 77, but everything else was sort of below 60 all the way through. So it's something that, yeah, you want to see a little bit more. But again, he's one that you could stash and then – and see how that's looking during the season too. Like it could be someone that um, you're just going, are these numbers coming through the VFL if that's where he's playing? And, and if he is getting a gig, like that's at least giving you that hope that he's going to be there for a bit. Yeah, no, I agree. Like, again, just one of those players that shows signs. It's just going to take a while for him to get going, I think. Um, move on to the last one on my list, and that's Ben Hobbs. I've got him as a stash as well. Love the way this guy goes about it. Um, as a young player, showed he can play that kind of inside midfielder role. Um, did get pegged up forward a little bit um, just to try to fit him into the side, I think. But um, what do you think he can produce next season, keeping in mind we talked about that deep midfield? What are your thoughts? Yeah, and that was the worry, wasn't it? Like we, as a fantasy classic hat on, you're, you're like your cash cows making money, but we just saw him sitting forward and that was yeah. um, a concern. I think one of the games I do remember, he, I think he had about eight handballs. Oh, not eight handballs, sorry. I'll call that points because it was two it was four handballs yeah. um, inside the first couple of minutes. And that's yeah. why he was sitting in the forward 50. And I was going, he can just find it, which is obviously the first part of um, any sort of inside slash outside midfielder. You want them to be able to get their hands on it. And that was an exciting part and to see that future. And and he's probably a little bit like Perkins with a bit of swag too, because he, he did – he did look at home at AFL level. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, he needs, needs a little bit more size, I guess, and yep. that's going to come after your first year of, of league footy. But there's enough there to go, yeah, if I'm stashing someone there um, out of <laughs> Massimo and Hobbsy, I would be going Hobbsy every day of the week. Yes, he's going to be mid only and that sort of thing moving forward because that's what it will be. And because of that stacked midfield, it might be a little bit of time. But I think that he, um, he would be a hold for me because I think he's – 
probably comes out of that crop, if that draft crop is one of the better fantasy prospects for us. Yeah, I get the feeling he's going to like kind of fit your third year breakout mold pretty nicely. I reckon so. Maybe one more season of up and down scoring, and then I reckon we'll hit the ground running. Because yeah, like you might said, have to have a look at the old uh, breakout tracker <laughs> during the season <laughs> next year to see how he's going along. Well, I think the the free version has the top ten um, out there, um, and I don't think he makes the top ten. Uh, on the breakout tracker but uh, yeah we'll see how he goes on that uh, at some stage Um, Warnie I've left a little spot here just anyone else you want to mention anyone that I've missed uh, from this show yeah, probably the only real name there that I was thinking about was Nick Cox. I think what we're going to see from him, he's going to be someone that might be sporadic scoring, but I think he's someone that will be able to find the ball because he's got tricks as well. That's the thing. He can be taking marks, which is always going to be a big part of his game, and he's got that run and carry too. Like it was, I think we we're almost a little bit surprised with how he was looking throughout um, that season where he was playing on that um, – he was playing on that wing and we could just yeah. see him run. And it was, a, a, you know, crazy to see that big fella doing that. But um, I think we'll see him able to score. I think that's the – and given the opportunity to score, it's going to be interesting again. This is a stash type thing yeah. to see how he how it plays out. But he, I think he's going to be a, a fantasy scorer for us. And, and who knows where he settles down. Could it be in defence? Um, could he, you know, think with his height, he could be taking a few of those marks. But yeah. then again, he could be doing that in the forward line too. So that, that wing role, it could be that prototype sort of player in the future. And that's something that we're looking at, those those big, tall guys. He's He needs to put on some size like a lot of young fellas do, but he's um, I, th- I like him a lot just for a fan's perspective, let alone what I think he could potentially do with fantasy as well because I think we could there'll be games where we see big scores from him because he'll put them all together. Yeah, 100%. I think, I don't know, like I think given his size, he might sometimes be utilised in other areas. So like you yeah. might have to do other things in defence or something like that or go sit forward for a bit. Um, he might end up being a Mr. Fix-It, I think, at some stage. But yeah. you're right, in that first season, did show a lot of promise on that wing and just did some freakish things that guys that tall shouldn't be able to do as well. So um, yeah, um, jury's still out for me on him because um, like sometimes you see a lot of the, the most talented players don't always end up becoming or the most as- athletic freaks and things like that don't end up becoming the best fantasy scorers. Um, I, ju- I just want to see him put up a few more bigger scores and more consistency before I kind of back him in. But um, there is so much potential there. It's crazy. So, yeah, I do like and that And that's one. what we're going to need to see. Like, we haven't really seen enough, and there haven't been enough career games full stop Correct. for him to, yeah. to really make a big call on. But he's just one that I think that we will be talking about him in a couple of years' time as going, yep, he's, he's draftable for us. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Well, we'll take a break here. We'll thank some gold members. So, um, yeah, each week I read out ten gold members' names. These are the people that sign up uh, on the website um, to get access to our premium resources um, and ultimately just support the show so we can keep it running and bring it to you each week. So, I want to thank the following names. Uh, thank you to Daniel Kennedy, James Elms, Bailey Espy, Matt Roach, Trent Rojan, uh, Lorenzo Foker. Sam Anderson, William DeKing, Brendan Scanlon, and Adam Child at the bottom of this list. Uh, is that true, Warner? You are a paid-up member of the Keeper League podcast. Of course I am. I'm a very proud and passionate paid-up because Keeper League, great resource. Love looking at it as much as I can, and whenever there's something I need to know, it's probably one of the first places I get to. So, Hef, you've done an awesome job with everything with the Keeper League, and uh, there's a good reason why there's plenty of us signed up as gold members. Would, uh, would you say you'd actually use it for research and stuff on your podcast and things like that? Yeah, definitely. And that's it. And even just some, some of those ideas then as well for my own keeper leagues. And, yeah. um, and just the tools are great. I think um, it's all very well presented. And, um, and as well, I want to support you because you do such good stuff. And that's, I think, a great thing about the fantasy community is that we do get around each other really well. So That's 100% true. Is, you guys are just as good as anyone. There was an episode at the start of um, last year, I think, where Calvin was looking up uh, the sample scores or something like that or the drafted fantasy scores, and he, I remember him saying, uh, just waiting for the Keeper League to load here and like, just yeah. passing. And, yeah, that, uh, that filled me with a little bit of pride there. So, you know, if it's good enough for the guts, no. uh, go and check it out. No, that's the thing. Just, uh, yeah, you might need to speed up the server for Calvin, but it might be more about him. He's, uh, he's just very slow at everything that he does. Yeah, it might not last his concentration span. I don't know. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll get stuck into just a few listener questions. Um, we got a lot for the SNS show, so we'll try not to talk about too many that we've already mentioned on the show, but um, just a few quick ones that shouldn't be too tricky here. Um, at Cherto5 asks, I reckon there's room for Merit and Parrish to go 110 plus and Shield to go 95. Is that a possibility, Warney? Uh, everything's a possibility. It'd be nice to see. <laughs> that would be meaning that um, for fantasy across across the team, things yeah. are looking a lot better and that's the way that they'd be looking at playing. So uh, is there room? Yes, but with the trends of teams uh, probably not having two players to yeah. 110, um, that's the thing. And I don't think you're going to see three midfielders, whatever, 110 plus 110 plus 95 go. I don't think that's... Yeah. Really a possibility, especially too, as we talked about, even with Bombers midfield batting so deep, it's um, it's something that, yeah, we're really not going to see unless they those three really were going 70% um, CBAs each. Yeah, as you mentioned, it would buck the trend from scoring overall in the competition to see players rise like that just from one team you'd expect to be having for all the teams and I don't know the way the game's going I'm not sure if there's just enough possessions and stuff to go around with the, how quickly the ball's moving and stuff like that so yeah um, interesting but uh, yeah I don't know if it's going to happen um, at Snap Biddy asks um, realistic non-statesman prediction for Setterfield uh, see I am a fan of Setterfield so I think that's he's someone that we can probably see <laughs> 80, he can do. 80? Well, if you look at the end of last year for Carlton oh, when there were so many injuries, it. finally got that inside role after playing on the wing for ages and actually put up some reasonable scores. So my question is just with your like – we've already mentioned a million times, your midfield depth, where does he sit in that thing? Like Dylan Shield kind of already does the stuff that he does. Does he ever take someone like him or like if he's going to play that inside role? What do you, what do you, what do you, where do you see he fits in the pecking order? And that and that's the issue. I, I don't see him sitting in there for that inside time. It's going to be that that wing stuff. He's going to be in the side. He's going to have his opportunity to do that. But how much he gets used on the outside with those guys, I think the biggest the biggest key to all of this midfield time is probably Dylan Shill and where that sits now. I yeah. think he he probably did enough at the end of last season yeah. to really I thought show he was like gone, he, but yeah, yeah. Nah. The and then, and then this preseason. I know it's all club talk and all that sort of stuff, but he's a bit of a preseason poster boy for the Bombers. So, yeah, if that continues on and correlates into the season, then it's it could be not great things for Setterfield. But you know, eighty is not out of the question. Yeah. Seventy five to eighty is even on wing with that little bit of time in the guts. The one positive um, around uh, trade time, he was specifically a player they targeted. They wanted to get a player like him in. So that always bodes well when you swap into a new club and they're actually targeting you specifically. Hopefully, they actually plan to use you when you get there. Um, yeah, yeah. All right, move on to at Sam Groper 19. Um, just a very quick one. Andy McGrath has been unable to average 85 in a season since debut. Realistically, is it feasible he'll crack 90 this year? Uh, no, I don't think so. That's... Um the honest answer, I think, um, which is then not going to be enough of where we're sort of really thinking about for the value of that. What about what do you think about that? I don't know. This is a, the one a shining tricky light. One. The one shining light I feel is he was switched between defence and midfield quite a bit last year, and just kind of it felt like he just never could get a consistent run at things. Like when he would go on defence, he'd play four or five games there, start to look good. Someone would get injured in the midfield, he'd go back there. Then I think, did he get injured himself? I can't actually remember. Um, yeah. I can't, yeah. I think there was a little period in the middle there. I'll let you look it up while I'm talking about it. Yeah, he missed a couple of games there yeah. in that middle and patch then after the bye. went back into defence after that. It just felt like he just could not get a decent run at things going. So I don't know, I think, he could push close to that 90 if he just sits on that halfback line, has a really cushy role. He could be one of the elite defenders. I do have a good feeling about that. It just depends whether they plan to use him elsewhere. And again, like how many users they've got in that Essendon back line, it's just a bit tricky to say. But to average 85 last season when you were still mixing roles up a, a, a fair bit and not consistently one spot, five points per game, it's probably not out of the question. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go as far to say 95 or anything like that, but I think he sits somewhere between that 85 and 90 mark. That's my gut feel. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. I think I'm just probably a little bit – it's a glass half empty, which is not often the, the case for me with the Bombers at times. <laughs> yeah, I, oh, look, and, you know, with the team like this for the new coach, who knows what's actually going to happen. Um, you yeah. know, he could be used in a completely different way to what we think, and, yeah, so could all of these players. So have to keep that in mind in the off-season and just have a look at it too. Um, so we talked about the uh, – 
Scott Game Style. Um, we talked about Nick Cox, um, and we really talk about uh, Will Snelling. I should sorry, we haven't talked about Will Snelling. Snelling. So Michael Bellardi, he uh, wants to know um, what is Will Snelling's role, and is he worth keeping? He's desperate for forwards. Yeah, he had a couple of good games um, during the season, but and that was and I'd need to have a look at that actually a little bit more to think about uh, where he was. What did he do? Yeah, he's up, had a couple of CBAs, so it wasn't much there. It was um, he doesn't get much of a run through there, but he had yeah. What was that? He had a a ninety four um, in round nineteen. That was so. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. He's obviously got forward status. Um, is he? In the team, is he in the best 22? After last year, you know, you could be, yeah, you're not too sure of where exactly he sits, but yeah, yeah a bit of a, a new coach. What's he going to be looking like? Very much a pre season game watch. Um, hopefully, we're all drafting after a pre season game to see where they might fit in the pecking order. But um, what can he average? Well, yeah, that's a that's a really tough one. It's a, it's a bench uh, little play, I think, that one. I think people are quite optimistic about him because I think two seasons ago he put up an average of about 80 or 78 or something around those mm. marks. So, But this was when he was playing kind of like a high half-forward connector role with spurts on the wing as well. Um, since then, you know, you've been playing Hobbs there. You put Langford back forward. Nick Martin's come in and just done a similar or did a similar type thing to where he went up to the wing permanently. I think just a few players have probably gone ahead of him from he – was, was he a mid-season draftee? Is that correct? A couple of years ago? <sighs> That's a good question. I think he may have been. I, I think, think he may have been. Yeah. yeah. So like in that, in that, when he comes in, oh, actually not sure. He might not have been, he might've just been a rookie, but oh no, sorry. It is because 2019, I think it's when it started because he, he didn't play for yep. three seasons. So that makes sense. Yeah. So I think when he comes in, they kind of use him a bit more. And then I think just he filled a gap for a bit of a while and then a few people have kind of overtaken him. So yeah, I think that's my gut feel is he's, that kind of 78 that he scored in uh, 2021 is probably a bit out of reach just with the few of the younger players, you know, Hobbsy and um, Martin coming in and then Langford kind of moving back up forward as well, probably just taking him off that role a bit, I think. I think that whole desperate for forwards thing too is there could be worse players if you, you're comfortable that he is in that 22. Yeah, and he might be a be good bench option at the, at the very least, but uh, yeah, not holding on to any huge scores from him. That's all. All right, uh, I reckon that'll wrap it up. So thank you very much, Warney, for joining us on the show this week. Uh, or sorry, today. I hope the uh, listeners enjoy having you on, uh, your insights on the Bombers players. Uh, anything you want to plug before we sign off? Uh, go and play fantasy at AFL Fantasy or fantasy.afl.com.au um, and all of our stuff I guess is all churning out on the AFL platform also our podcast we, uh, we're back to normal very soon we are uh, doing our club previews which are definitely not as good as um, yours over here on the Keeper <laughs> League but we um, yeah got those, a couple of those to go and then we'll um, yeah be into the, the normal pre-season which is actually ticking down very quickly I think that's the yes. that's the thing we're not far away from February and then because of the uh, the gather round, extra round in there, we yep. before we know it, it'll be round one. We'll I think be we're just six over weeks six away weeks so. away. Yeah, so it's not far. Yeah, it's pretty but, nuts. Uh, so very exciting, though. I'm looking forward to uh, this season. It's uh, a lot of unknowns for all um, f- formats of fantasy, I think, the way that we're looking because, um, I don't know, with this, a few new coaches, uh, the game is changing, I think, um, the way that they're playing, the, the copycat league that we have, like is – is that run and gun the right way to go? Do those fantasy scores keep decreasing? And so are we going to find that value for our drafts um, a lot later than normal because we are trying to find these guys that might have a little bit more of a jump? So, yeah, it's very exciting times, especially in our keeper leagues as well. Absolutely. Well, thanks again for joining us. Um, before I sign off, uh, get around us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok uh, at Keeper League Pod on all of those. Uh, make sure you use our Manscaped code as well, uh, Keeper20 for 20% off and free shipping. And also, if you wish to support the podcast, please consider signing up as a member. But if that's uh, I'm not in the realms of possibility. Um, you can also just follow us on any of our socials or retweet our stuff or give us a subscribe on YouTube. All that sort of stuff really helps uh, to you know grow the podcast and uh, yeah, keep it going forward. Anyways, thanks again, Warney, and we'll talk to you soon. Legend. Thanks, Hef.